Hello again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We are very glad that you could join us for another show. We've got some great features for you and of course we're going to be answering all of those garden questions. Once again, we can't take your phone calls tonight. You can still submit those pictures and emails for a future show. That's byf at unl.edu. Do tell us where you live. Give us as much information about your issue as you can. And of course, we can't get to all your questions on the air, but you can search for information on our social media pages, YouTube and Facebook. With that out of the way, we're gonna welcome Kyle for his first show of the season with a piece of a pine or something. Yeah piece of pine and some pine needle scale. Uh, so these little white flecks, I uh, can get those. Um, these are the pine needle scales. So those are the adults. This is an armored scale. Uh, so they produce this waxy covering um, that really protects them pretty well on, on these scales. So it creates a lot of, a lot of issues with treating them. Um, so these, these particular scales, um, they, they feed on uh, most species of pines, uh, spruce, fir, they, or scotch pine is in particular susceptible to these. Um, and so in a, a lot of cases, if, if you have a relatively low density, they're not too problematic. Um, but when you really start getting needle, needles covered, uh, they can start causing issues. Um, you can get premature needle drop and even some dieback if you have, you know, sort of that outbreak status for uh, multiple years uh, on, on some of those species of pines. So um, there are something that, you know, if you're, you're starting to see them build up, you, you might really want to consider treating. So uh, to treat these guys, like with pretty much all scales, uh, we're really targeting the crawler stage. And uh, for this particular scale, they have a few different uh, generations here in Nebraska. Uh, so there's a stage that will, uh, or excuse me, will have those overwintering eggs emerge in the spring. Um, and then there will be a second generation that comes in the summer, um, sometime in July. Uh, however, that, that later gener uh, generation in July, um, the egg hatch is, is extended for several weeks. And so that's really not the best one to target. Uh, you really want to target those uh, the spring for for uh, treating these. So the uh, the crawlers they're very tiny. They're kind of red, and one of the best things you can do to monitor for those is you know when you have an infested branch like this is shaking it over um, a piece of paper, a white sheet of paper, and uh, and then you can sort of it makes it a lot easier to identify those tiny little uh, reddish crawlers on on that piece of paper. And a hand lens, something like that, can be uh, further helpful. So I would suggest watching for those uh, in, in the spring. Generally speaking, we're looking at May. Um, actually, this is one that's been in the lab for a little bit, um, and crawlers have already emerged. Uh, but I think for, for anything else, we'll probably be seeing those in the next few weeks. So monitor for those. Um, when they do start emerging, those crawlers, you actually do have a little bit of a window to treat them. Uh, they'll feed for about a week. Um, they'll, they'll settle down, feed for about a week, and then go to a second hyaline stage. And that stage is still susceptible. They haven't secreted that waxy covering yet. And so what I would suggest is as soon as you're seeing those crawlers, you can either wait a little bit to treat so that you're you know, kind of allowing all those eggs to hatch, or you could give it two treatments uh, with an insecticidal uh, soap or horticultural oil. Um, with, with those, you know, again, thorough coverage is, is really the key. All right, excellent. Watch for those little tiny pieces of dandruff. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Amy, the, the beautiful boxwood. The beautiful boxwood. So this is actually for my home. This is boxwood. We've been getting uh, questions about boxwood blight. And just so you know, we do not have boxwood blight in Nebraska confirmed, according to Kyle. This is actually environmental damage, and this is a, what we see commonly with boxwoods throughout the state. Um, these are lower branches on my boxwood. But the big thing is when we look at it is the coloration that we're seeing. You know, those leaves, they're a light brown to yellow in coloration, almost white in color. Um, that's a great indication of environmental damage if we were trying to compare this to boxwood blight. The other big trick is if you are concerned about boxwood blight, A, you need to submit a sample into Kyle so you can confirm it but you would also see fungal fruiting structures on it. And with this little guy, if you look at the stem, the stem is absolutely clean. I mean, it's spotless. So this is another indication that this is environmental. So the trick with boxwoods, 
Um, especially where I live up in northern Nebraska, boxwoods aren't real happy there. Uh, it gets a little too cold. You would want to make sure they're in a protected area. But one of the problems I have with this sample for myself is it's underneath the awning of the house. And with the winter that we had, it's a little bit of de uh, desiccation. It just didn't have enough s supplemental water. So that's one thing we want to be looking at, um, especially in the fall and coming into the spring. So what is your solution? You're going to get those nippers out and prune out those dead spots. As long as you're not taking out more than a third to a half of the plant, you're just fine. If you're taking more than half the plant, eh, it's probably time to replace it with something else. And we have a lot of those. Uh, let's replace it with something else, as I'm afraid. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Amy. All right, Jeff. Beauty. Yeah. So I brought in pearl bush. So it, right now it's it's doing its thing. Uh, and pearl bush is it's very hardy here. It does well in in eastern Nebraska. Uh, it has a tendency to be kind of a a fountain shaped plant. It tends to kind of grow grow up out of a a center crown and then kind of cascade over and so you'll have these flowers kind of hanging down around it. Um, from my experience, they tend to be about as tall as they are wide. They kind of maintain that uh, ratio as they get larger, but they can get pretty good size. I've seen them as large as eight to 10 foot tall. So mm -hmm. this one's about six foot by six foot. And I think we have some on campus that we've had for a long, long time. And yeah, this is a seedling ones. from one of those. Yeah, yeah so. Very beautiful, yeah. pure white. Yeah. All welcome. right. Thanks all. Good start. We're going to start right in with our picture questions. Um, Kyle, you have a couple from faraway places. So this first one is actually um, AM in Galveston, Galveston, Texas, where he is studying and he wonders what this is. He had looked for hours and hours and hours reached out to you, which says Nebraska is the place to go if you don't know anything, right? I guess so, yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I absolutely love this picture. Um, it's, it's an aphid, and I, I have uh, kind of a soft place uh, for, for aphids, um, but this, this is uh, a giant bark aphid. So it's not just any aphid. Um, really cool, this is actually the largest aphid in North America. Mm. And uh, rather than, than feeding on leaves like most species do, uh, these, these actually, they feed through the bark. So they have really, really gnarly mouth parts that, that are able <laughs> to get, get through there. They're pretty cool. Um, generally, they don't, you know, they're not causing any sort of harm or anything, but they'll feed on a variety of, you know, hardwood deciduous trees. How, how big is big? Because it looks like it's a, as big as a wasp. Um, small wasp, yeah, it's like, you know, maybe like the body about a quarter of an inch, but like with the, the legs and everything, it's, it's bigger. Wow, for heaven's sakes. All right, well, thank you to him for sending that. Uh, your next one here is a broken bow viewer, and they want to know what this is, and they think it's an ant with wings and says there are hundreds of them on the back patio. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely right. This is a, a winged ant, so this is a, a swarmer. So, um, you know, when, when ants, they, they reproduce, they, they produce these winged males and females, they, they come out in, in the swarm. Uh, hence swarmers, and um, and that's what they're seeing. They're seeing these these winged ants come out mating. Um, the males will will basically die. The females will go off and become queens, starting starting new colonies. All right, excellent. And your third one uh, is actually a follow up to a question we had a couple weeks ago. This viewer had um, all of these wasps, he thinks, in his house plants, um, and then. He, he couldn't really send us any good pictures. He caught more of them, released them outside, and he wonders what they are and why in the world did they, did they come in in the house plants? What happened here? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, there's actually a, a lot of wasps that have almost identical pattern to this, but I believe this is a, a sand wasp. And um, so, you know, they, they're predatory on, on other insects. Um, and they, they make these burrows, nests in sandy soil, hence sand wasp, and, and they then provision those, um, those nests with, with the insects that they're, they're preying on. Um, why it ended up you know, in, inside, I'm not exactly sure. I don't know if, if potentially um, you know, these were plants that had been outside and you had, you know, had one that started, um, or had, had that burrow, that nest in there, and now we're seeing the adults this year emerge from that. That's a possibility. Um, that would be my best guess. Do they uh, sting like the rest of them? Yeah, they, they would be able to sting, but um, 
in, in general, they're like they're more solitary, so they're probably not aggressive. It probably would take a lot of provocation to get a sting from one. All right, excellent. Thank you, Kyle. Okay, Amy, uh, mm -hmm. the first one here is a Blair viewer. Uh, she's growing hyacinth bean from seed, and the leaves are getting these yellow splotches. She's had them in bright light, sunny windows. Um, she did take them outside on the 27th, but she's wondering, is this disease or nutrition? I would lean more to the nutrition side. Give them a little bit of fertilizer. They should green right back up. All right, all right. Your next one, um, this, is, this is fun. This is a viewer who rescued, <laughs> he rescued a banana plant out of a dumpster Ooh. <laughs> a few years ago, but he's seeing this, this sort of interesting leaf browning and so forth. John uh, talked about this a little bit in lightning round a couple weeks ago and said bananas do that, but he did send these better pictures and he's wondering if there is something that, that he could do to keep this banana from doing this. Doing do we this. know what this is? So I actually had to do a little bit of searching because I don't have a lot of banana experience. Um, there is a lot of fungal diseases found on bananas, but the great advantage we have being in Nebraska is those fungal spores aren't found here. Um, so that's good for you. Um, it is most likely, John is right, it's most likely an environmental reaction of some sort. Um, one thing I would be careful with banana in a lot of houseplants is what is your water source? Are you using city water with it? If you are using city water, sometimes we'll see a concentration of fluoride, uh, chlorine, depending on where you're at, and sometimes salt if you've been doing a lot of fertilizer. So typically what I look for a plant like that is maybe flush out the root system, um, buy some bottled water, distilled water, something like that, flush that root system out and see if the plant will respond back to that a little bit. It could just be a toxicity response to nutrients and other minerals in the water. Interesting. All you right. know, I've been growing bananas for 20 years at mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. So, and I've got them to flower and fruit and all that stuff. And so, I think, you know, one of the other things to think about is just what you're saying as far as flushing. And I think with bananas, as far as watering, I tend to saturate the soil. They're a heavy water user, obviously, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and let it dry down and then kind of go through that cycle of sa versus keeping a, an even moisture mm -hmm. level that seems to cause more problems. And you start having root rot, you start having yeah. some issues like that. But if I allow it to, if I soak it really well, mm -hmm. let it dry down, soak it really well, that seems to... I, you know, I can get through the winter with three or four big bananas in the house and they do they do fine. Well, that actually makes more sense because it's more of their natural environment. Right. You know, they have the rainy season and then the dry mm -hmm. season. Right. Interesting. So, anyway. All right. Well, maybe that'll help. So thank you both. All right. Uh, Jeff, quite a few uh, rhododendron questions this year. This, this one is a, a Lincoln viewer. Uh, she has had this for over 10 years. It's never flowered. She does say it has been all over the yard. So I, I'm interpreting that as she has moved it a lot. It's now on the north side of a building of, of her home. So, sure. Well, I, I think probably there's a couple things. One is on the north side of the building, it, it's rhododendrons can do well in Lincoln, uh, eastern Nebraska, uh, but they have to be in a fairly protected site. So I Lean, lean towards the east side of a building, that sort of thing. So it's out of the winter wind, out of the late day sun in the summertime. Uh, making sure that you've amended the soil. So I'm gonna want a lot of organic matter in the soil to see if we can raise the pH a little bit on that. Um, and then the other thing too is um, the particular variety that they selected may not be flower hardy right. here. And that's probably the idea there that Right. Um, there's some proven ones, and we see PGM everywhere. It seems to be able to flower in whatever kind of winter we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and so and there's others that will do well, but that this may be one that just isn't. Well, and especially looking at those smaller leaves, that it seems like there are a lot of those small-leaved rhododendrons that are so beautiful in the garden centers mm -hmm. in the spring. And, right. Yeah. All right, your next set uh, is a carny viewer. They have a, a Manhattan Euonymus hedge, and the hedge is about 250 feet long, so this is a big one. Um, leaves started turning yellow and falling off, left less than 50% of the foliage is left. I think we have three pictures on this. It's never happened before. Um, so what do we think here? 
Well, I think it, possibly a couple things. One, um, Kyle might want to talk about scale. I mm -hmm. think that that's maybe, um, and you know, Wanamus in particular will have problems with it. And this, to me, with the yellowing leaves is maybe an indication of that, although it's fairly early in the year. So mm -hmm. um, the other thing would be, you know, they're, uh, again, a pretty good water user. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they have a mass of roots. Um, and so if we haven't been watering them, if it's been dry in this particular area, mm -hmm. um, that may be one of the issues. And then, you know, we had some crazy low temperatures this year, and so this may be, you know, one of those years where some of that growth, some of those leaves that normally overwinter just aren't making it. So um, I would look to see if we're continuing, if we're seeing some new buds, some new leaves come out, that's a good indication. I would look at how we're watering, and then maybe we think about some sort of horticulture oil or something mm -hmm. here in the next few weeks. Well, yeah. in Manhattan, you want them as in Kearney, Nebraska. Manhattan is from Manhattan, Kansas. Right. So it's interesting that they've gotten it to live that long. Right. All right. Well, you know, we showed you some fantastic spring flowering trees last week. And as many of you know, bulbs are another great way to get that early splash of color. The traditional bulbs are great. We thought we'd show you a few that aren't quite as common. There are few things more joyous in the spring than those great spring bulbs. And while we all think a little bit or a lot about the common ones like tulips and daffodils and maybe hyacinths, there are many, many other bulbs that we can actually use in our landscape. Some of them are very unusual. They're a little harder to find, but they give just that different piece of interest in the landscape and give you something to talk about with your neighbors and your friends. So let me talk about a few of those today, and of course we can't cover all of them. I want to start with one called Summer Snowflake. It's not summer, it usually doesn't flower this early, but when it does, it is these delicate little white flowers tipped with green. The leaves look a little like daffodil, and they're only carried, these flowers are only carried about three to a stem. So really a beautiful, tall, quiet little bulb as opposed to being in your face like some of the tulips. Then we have this fabulous bulb called Iphion, and it's commonly referred to as star flower. There are various cultivars of this, perfect star-shaped, large blue flowers in various shades of blue, and it's blooming right now at the same time as our native prairie smoke. And then we have one of the pasque flowers, which is one of the red ones which is flowering a little bit later than our native pasque flowers. So it's a very, very interesting combination. One of my absolute favorites is checkered lily or snake's head lily or guinea hen lily. You can call it really what you want. Comes straight out of the ground, looks like a snake's head when it's in bud. Then every single one of those flowers opens with a checkered pattern on it. So the checkered pattern shows up even on the white ones. And then, of course, it goes quiet and dormant, as do really most of our bulbs. Now, when we do talk about tulips and daffodils, one of the things that you could really consider is choosing the ones that are a little bit unusual. Tulips in particular come in multiple species types of tulips. They're certainly not the great big cutting ones like the Darwins, but interesting colors. They may have petals that are recurved. Some of them are even a little in lavender tiny close to the ground, maybe one that is yellow and orange or red striped, stripes in the foliage, really a different character. And some of those are a little hardier than the ones that we use for cutting tulips. Then of course, we also have some of the ones that we do use for cutting tulips called the peony flowered tulips. The daffodils of course come not only in the great big yellow cupped ones, smaller cupped, little ones that naturalize, that will really give you a different sort of an appearance wherever you're going to plant them. And one final comment on some of the unusual bulbs. Once you start looking for them and you examine the hardiness, of course, and whether it will actually live in your zone and truly be perennial, you can find different fertile areas that are going to be purple and yellow. You can find bulbs that you've never really even heard of before and give them a try. Right now, of course, in the spring, as I said, is when you look 
at what you like or you try to find it somewhere because we plant the bulbs almost always in the fall for these early spring blooming ones. And that means you're going to have to have it fixed in your mind before you order in the fall. Keep in mind also that the bulbs are going to go dormant after flowering. So if you have a big space in your landscape that you've filled with bulbs, you're going to have to cover that up with something or just have a bare spot. You know, we can show you all the beautiful flowers we want to. You're still gonna have to make those mental notes about the bulbs you'd like to try. Make that plan, buy them, get them in the ground this fall. And they are pretty this year. All right, Amy, or no, Kyle, Kyle's next. So Kyle, this is a Lincoln viewer, found several of these things on their 10-year-old Northern Gold for Scythia. They wonder if it's a gall, is it normal or trouble? So I actually think maybe you had it right, and it, it, it is Amy's question, but um, <laughs> no, I, I, I was checking it out, and I, I think that this is actually, rather than being caused by an insect, um, that this is, is a plant path issue here. Um, so this, this gall seems to be caused by, uh, uncertain, but probably um, a pseudomonious bacterium. Right, and, um, luckily, the other Kyle had looked at the picture and conferred with Kyle. Um, yeah, there is a pseudomonas. Um, so the trick is you're gonna wanna prune it out, <clears throat> but it's a bacteria. So you need to go further back on the stem. We wanna go anywhere from 10 to 12 inches back. Um, so really keep that in mind. I would also want to clean your clippers in between cuts so you're not moving that bacteria to other places in that forsythia. Right. And then throw it in the trash. Don't put it in the compost, please. So it is so interesting that you, I mean, you just can't tell from a picture yeah. necessarily whether it's a rot in a spot or an yeah, insect. For sure, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. All right, your next one, Kyle, is, uh, this is a 50 plus year old sycamore. It does have bark coming off in pieces, which sycamores do, but not like this. He did say that he's found pieces that have roly polies under them and wonders what really is going on here and whether he, uh, she should treat this. Sure, so <clears throat> I'd, I'd be curious to see more of the tree. I don't know what the lifespan of sycamore normally is, um, but with roly polies, the isopods, you know, they're, they're decomposers, they're feeding on fungi and, and decaying plant matter. So they're not hurting anything, um, they need that sort of moist environment. So, you know, I, I think they're just, they're there because it's a, a good environment. I think there are sim, or, you know, there are sort of evidence of uh, a greater issue going on, but they're not causing any problems. So definitely from an in insect perspective, I, I wouldn't treat for that. I, mm -hmm. I'm suspicious that there's, you know, some, some just you know, declining health of the tree, maybe some other issues going on where, where you're having some fun yeah, fungi in there decaying and yeah, doing that. He did send a picture of just the trunk with maybe one other little hole, but okay. not a picture of the whole tree, so we couldn't see the canopy on the tree. And I know we have some old sycamores on Yeah, they're long-lived in yeah. this area, so. Yeah. I suppose it'd be one of those, I'd be tempted to probe those holes and just see, you know, yeah. a flag or something, just see how far so we deep. can go in there. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't a heart rot right. working its way out. Mm -hmm. And so if it's close to the house, you definitely want to do that and remove it. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. All right, Amy, now it's your turn. Okay. Uh, this is also a Lincoln viewer, but it could be many viewers. <laughs> uh, your first two pictures here are um, this particular spruce has had marked needle fall in the past couple of years, many dead branches. Most of the branches have needles at the ends only, and the trunk has a lot of weeping in it. It is a 30-foot spruce. Okay. So that's your first couple. So you're probably dealing with a couple different things. Um, seeing those needles the way they are, you're most likely dealing with some type of fungal needle cast. There's a couple different ones that we find on blue spruce. Typically it affect, affects the older needles and not those new needles and those new candles on the front. That's the reason why the tips are still green. Mm -hmm. um, the weeping on the trunk, most likely we're looking at Cetospora canker, which is very common in blue spruce. We get that weeping and then we're gonna start seeing decline of the tree um, just because we're inhibiting the movement of water and nutrients in that tree. So in all reality, the Cetospora canker is a slow, painful death. Um, the tree might last another you know, 10, 15 years, but you will see further decline of that tree over time. All right, and 30 years is a nice long life for mm -hmm. a spruce with the strange and 
yeah. environmental conditions we've been having. All right, Amy, your next two pictures are a Goner viewer. Um, this is a con color fur, it, and, sh and she says it's kind of dying on the inside. It's only about six years old. I think we have a second picture maybe of the, yeah, it's doing that in the interior. And I know we had a little issue with con color last year with some of them. We did, and the trick is typically con colors don't have a lot of disease issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we typically don't find needle casts in them or chip lights. A lot of times it ends up being more environmental. Mm -hmm. uh, con collars can be a little finicky about where they are placed. Mm -hmm. um, they want water, but not too much water. They're, I, and I'm sure Jeff and Kim could talk more, they're finicky. Mm -hmm. And so I would lean more toward more an environmental component. Mm -hmm. Also keep in mind, they don't leave their, keep their needles on forever. Right. They will drop those inside needles. Typically we'll see that flush, that yellowing and sudden drop all at one time of the year. Um, maybe that's what the con color is doing, but I would probably lean toward more environmental. Yeah, I think you're right on that. That's kind of far west for con color mm -hmm. maybe too and pretty exposed. All right, uh, Jeff, your first two are a, um, a viewer who has a new front yard mm. and a lovely tree. Mm -hmm. uh, crab apple, mm -hmm. uh, but of course the first one shows the tree, the second one shows the suckers around the bottom, right. and they're wondering what they can do about it. Well, you know, it, it is a beautiful crab apple, and, um, and really for suckering crabs, there's not a lot you can do. I, the one thing you, you're gonna wanna do is make sure your, your pruners are sharp, go out and cut those as low as you can. Try not to get into the roots, try not to do a, any particular damage to, um, uh, the stem or anything like that. So we just want to take the suckers out. And then um, going forward, we're going to want to avoid um, any kind of heavy pruning through the winter or early spring. I, I tend to lean towards a midsummer pruning on crab apples that are showing this. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to respond less um, mm -hmm. to that pruning. Anytime you prune a tree, it tends to respond by putting on some new growth. And by doing it mid-season like that, the response is less and so it lowers your chance for suckering. All right, and your next one is, uh, this is a Gretna viewer. Mm -hmm. You're not looking at the arborvita, you're looking at the stumps next to the arborvita, which was apparently a, a silky dogwood, which is one of the red stems. Okay. And um, he, he wants to know whether he can treat the stumps with something, he's talking a concentrated glyphosate or something like that. Uh, without damaging the arborvita or does because he doesn't want the dogwood to come back up. Sure. I would not do that. So I think uh, most herbicides have an opportunity to translocate through the root systems and may all then connect and if they're growing closely to the arborvitae, they're a very fibrous root system, both of them are. And so I think you have a, a chance of affecting those. If, you know, uh, dogwoods are fairly easy to dig out Sharpen your spade, get in there, um, get some iced tea, and uh, you know, start working around it. But they're pretty easy to dig out. And don't do it this weekend when it's going to be 90. Right, or in the morning. Do it before the spring game. <laughs> there you go. All right, thanks, Jeff. Well, we do still have a lot of plants in our greenhouses, but planting time is coming up soon. Let's take a minute to hear from Terry James out of the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, again, things a little status quo, but our raised beds are looking fantastic. This sun has been helping, a little bit of moisture that we've been getting. We have our peas coming up. We have our radishes, our lettuces. We even have some of our Italian dandelion winter over from last year. So that's up and going and, and all these nice greens are looking fantastic. So we're looking forward to seeing uh, these start to produce here in a few weeks. We also are seeing stuff in the greenhouse grow. We're actually going to have to start pinching some stuff back. Um, a lot of our tomatoes, we're actually going to have to move up into the next size container. So everything is looking fantastic. We're still doing a little bit of weeding across the garden, making sure we're pulling out some of those weeds that we really don't want, but leaving a handful for those pollinators to get those flowers. We have uh, the next set of flowers coming across the garden. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out.
Everything looks great in our raised beds and that soil we've carefully prepared is just begging us to get the rest of those plants planted. So stay tuned. Right now it is time for the lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jeff, you'll be just fine. <laughs> Your first one is a Fremont viewer. Uh, she bought a potted hyacinth and it was in flower. Finished flowering, uh, she knows she needs to keep the leaves on it, but she wonders, can she put it in the garden for next year and expect it to reflower? I don't know, I don't think so. I think that's something you might wanna keep inside or keep as a potted plant and, and treat it that way. All right, uh, this is a Scandia viewer. She has a couple of old bittersweet vines about two feet apart. She doesn't get any fruit. She's wondering if she just plants a partner plant next to it, will she get the fruit? Well, um, she'd have to make sure that she has, if, if obviously we don't have a male and a female, so right. that's the problem. So she'd have to find uh, the female or the male. So. Right. Uh, this is a viewer in Lincoln who knows they shouldn't have planted flowering pear, but it was already full planted okay. and they have very few flowers on it but the leaves seem fine. Is it going to be okay? I think so, yes. Right. All right. Uh, this is a carny viewer who has rhubarb that kind of froze. Some of the stalks are limp. Is it okay to still harvest the rest of it? Yeah, it should be fine. Just cut out the limp ones. All right. Transplanting lily of the valley and ferns now? Or sure, like, yeah, they'll live through anything. Lily of the Valley, any time of the year. 105 <laughs> degrees, 35 below, Winter. transplant it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, thanks, Jeff. Okay, Amy, you ready? Yep. It's not a very rotty and spotty year yet, but... It's coming. Yeah. All right, this is a Lincoln viewer uh, who wonders how to remove mold from vinyl siding. Ooh. Use a chemical or what? So... Pressure washer and 10% bleach solution should help alleviate the problem. And you need to figure out why you have mold so you have a water issue somewhere. So whether it's sprinkler hitting it all the time or something like that. All right. Uh, this is a Lincoln viewer that has white dust on turf in the shade. What is that and what should be done about it? Oh, I had it until I had rain this week. Um, powdery mildew. Loves the humidity, shaded areas. Um, not a lot you can do for it. All right, uh, this is a, actually in the Niobrara era, area. They're wondering whether it is time to treat for those pine diseases. Actually it is. So you wanna go out there and start seeing if those candles, those baby needles are starting to elongate, are starting to come out and we need to make those applications. All right, uh, is there any way to know whether tomatoes and peppers have diseases when you buy them in the pot? In the pot, uh, really look to see if there's any brown spots on them. If you wait later in the growing season and you're buying them at 50% off, sometimes they're brown just because they didn't get enough water. But um, peppers, there's definitely some bacterial diseases that we don't see until later because it needs 90 90 plus degrees and it's just not that warm. So try to find something just nice, big, healthy, and thriving. All right, thanks. All right, Kyle, you ready? I'm ready. This is a Stanton viewer who says they have a small retail greenhouse and it is a wasp magnet. Is there a way to discourage them from coming into their greenhouse? <laughs> Basically exclude, seal up, I, but I don't know how you do that for a greenhouse, so <laughs> they're probably not hurting anything and probably helping by, you know, mm -hmm. killing something else. on, yeah, mm -hmm. caterpillars, so. All right. This is a Creighton viewer who has the coiled, and they put that in quotes, worms in their basement. How do we eradicate those? Um, again, you know, sealing up, it's, it, my guess is it's millipedes mm -hmm. and s some homes just get those, so um, you vacuum them up and if you can find entry points, seal it up, deal with moisture issues, they need humid environments, so. Okay, uh, one of our beauty pictures after the break was a bumblebee house that a viewer built, but he doesn't know how high to put it off the ground and where to put it. It's, it's not really clear uh, what <laughs> they like, but I would, if it was me, I'd do it on the ground. All right. And then uh, this is a viewer who overwintered butterfly milkweed plant inside and has aphids. Anything to do about it? Um, probably insecticidal soap is what I do. All right, excellent, nice job all. Okay, Jeff, plants of the week. Yeah, we have a couple cool plants here. 
Uh, I'll start off with Kim's favorite, the <laughs> woodland phlox mm -hmm. that you brought in. Uh, so it's a native phlox, um, and you said you're finding it in the woods. Yeah, in the woods. In bloom right now. Yeah. yeah. So which is fun. Mm -hmm. So obviously this is something that's going to need some shade, some even moisture, probably some high organic soil. So mm -hmm. uh, something to consider if you want to try that. And then the other one is also a ground cover. Uh, this is Lamiastrium and uh, Yellow Archangel, Herman's Pride, a couple different names you might hear it go under. Um, it is a bulletproof plant, one of my favorites. And uh, it does have a tendency to spread. And you can see it's flowering right now. I have this, we have this on campus. I have it at home. Kim has it at home. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really nice right now. It really lights up the areas underneath trees and that sort of thing with the, with the flowers. So. Mm -hmm. But it can be a bit aggressive, so it's something, like a lot of ground covers, you're going to have to manage those. You may have to do some cleaning around other plants, especially perennials, to make sure that it doesn't tend to overtake it. So, Right, excellent. Pollinators do like it if there were any around right now. Yeah, I noticed too. <laughs> I didn't see, I expected to see some bees, some honeybees, yeah. something, and nothing. Nothing. So. All right, uh, Kyle, let's see. This is uh, your next picture question. This is a viewer by Greenwood, and she was digging uh, some things out of her iris and found it. She just wants to know what it is. Uh, yeah, this beautiful thing is a six-spotted tiger beetle. Nice, very pretty. Then your second one here, this is, just, this is way cool. Um, this viewer knows what this is. She just thought she'd share it. She observed the female laying eggs last fall on a west-facing limestone wall. She guarded the eggs for a day before she departed. This hatched on April 28th. What is this? These, yeah, these are wheelbug nymphs. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, really cool. We had a huge year for those last year, it seems like. So I'm curious to see what it'll be like this year. But mm -hmm. uh, those, those are the nymphs that just closed. And... Mm -hmm. Good guys. Yep. Excellent. All right, now you have yet another one from way far away. This is a Fayetteville, Texas viewer or at least they were there, and found this strange looking inchworm on a building. Um, any idea what this one is? Yeah, this, this is a caterpillar for a geometrid uh, moth. And um, you can identify it by, even to the genus, by those projections, uh, the filaments just behind the head. Um, that's pretty characteristic for many different uh, geometrid uh, moths that have various filaments on the body. Some can be really ornate, mm -hmm. um, but kind of help camouflage it on, on the you know, branches, whatever, twigs they're, they're, they're feeding on. Mm, looks like rabbit ears. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amy, this is, uh, this is a viewer who found these black spots on the trunk of a maple. Uh, they're black and they're sappy and they're moist and they're producing a dark reddish brown sticky substance. And I think we have maybe one more picture of this. What to do? Well, and the trick is if you look at this picture, it looks like there was damage to the tree. It tried to callus over. Mm -hmm. So we could be looking at something as simple as a canker that's starting to weep. Um, maples are known to weep naturally. Um, we're we're kind of getting into that time of year for it. Um, but with that wound there, I would lean more toward a fungal canker. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way the spores are gonna get uh, moved. And so like we talked before, you'll wanna check the integrity of that tree. See um, if you can put a flag into it or anything like that. If it goes into that bark really easy and into that heartwood, then we may wanna look at removal of that tree. All right, um, Amy, your next one is an Ashland viewer. They live along the plat. Spotted this shroom growing out of a dead tree. Um, what is it and can it be eaten? Eaten. So I took a lot of time looking at this. I believe it is an elm oyster mm. mushroom, but it is actually not an oyster. If you take a look at it, the gills don't go down to the steeple or to the base. Oysters, the gills all go all the way to where they attach. So it's a false oyster. Um, this one's also way mature. You see how it goes up. Um, uh, oyster would be very flat. So with any wild mushrooms, unless you are absolutely positive of what you are collecting, we do not recommend that you consume them. All right. And your last one is apparently an O'Neill viewer that has these holes in a tree. <laughs> yeah. So this one actually came um, 
down by Burwell around Calamus, around mm -hmm. the lake. It is an old ash tree. And so Kyle had that picture of the sycamore. This is what happens when you have a bunch of heart rot that mm -hmm. has occurred. And the critters have come moved in, mm -hmm. um, making themselves at home because it was easy to move its way out. And what the viewers actually end up saying is it was baby raccoons that had been playing in there because they were just high enough in the tree that they could scamper in and out. But the tree came down because the integrity was very, very poor. All right, thanks, Amy. Uh, Jeff, this is a viewer who uh, has this grapevine. Uh, there's a couple pictures here at their new home. He's thinking he needs to prune it because it looks too dense. Uh, any ideas on how to uh, prune it or when? Um, well, you would prune it early in the spring before we leaf out or late winter. Um, so we're probably getting past that pruning date. Although I will say they've, um, you know, this part here doesn't look that concerning to me. It doesn't look that dense. There's not that many kings coming out of one spot. Um, maybe for next year you could look at removing some and, and you may get away with taking out a little bit now. Uh, kind of over the top of the trellis section, it is fairly dense. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, at this stage, I don't know if you could really hurt this plant. It's, it looks like it's pretty pretty well established. If you want to go in there and do some pruning to kind of thin things out a little bit, that's not going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. I think they also talked about having fruit loss right. through the year. So Japanese beetle will strip your grapes of everything. In so, yeah. I'm, And I'm, the birds will take the remains. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I'm sure they got hit by, I mean, I stopped growing grape because of it. I just got tired of fighting it, so. <laughs> All right, your next one is actually a power company service line through a maple tree. This is in Omaha and um, there's a large 10 inch diameter. You can see it on, mm -hmm. on the left. So they want to, they're thinking about taking off that large branch. It's maybe 25% of the canopy. They're wondering, should they go ahead and do that or should they try to get that line reattached in a different place? Yeah, you know, this is a tough one. Um, and I think the homeowners are gonna have to make a decision. I, there's a, yes, I mean, the short answer is sure, you can take that branch off. It's gonna shorten the life of the tree. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also talking about a silver maple um, I'm thinking long term you might want to decide if you want a silver maple growing in that location in your yard. Right. If it's close to the house, if it's close to power lines, uh, even if you take that branch out, at some point you're going to be dealing with branches growing through those power lines right. um, or falling on the power lines after an ice storm. So, Yeah, decide. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, last week we heard from John Porter about certain buzzwords like organic, natural, non-GMO and their meanings. There's a lot of other important information for you to read and follow when you're picking up things like fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides. So here's Kathleen Q to tell us more. So you go to the garden center with your plant sample looking for a solution to a plant problem and you're wondering how in the world am I going to solve this when you have this vast array of product to look at. How do you sort through all of this? Well there are some key things that you can do. First and foremost you want to make sure that you have an identification of the problem. It would be a big problem if you accidentally applied a herbicide to something that's an insect problem. We don't want those kind of devastating consequences. So we wanted that ID in hand and we can go with a, to the garden center with our plant sample or you can check with someone like me who does diagnosis all the time. And so you can check out your local county extension offices to do that. So one of the things that garden centers really do to help you is they organize things according to the particular problem you're dealing with. So in this particular area, we have all of our herbicides. Behind that then there are a lot of insecticides and from there we have fungicides, which are for fungal plant issues. Then on this side, we have a lot of things that have to do with fertilizers. And it's all about be, knowing how to read that label. And so let's go through some of those key concepts that you need to know. First, ready to use versus concentrates. Ready to use products are made with lots of water and the product already mixed together. It's for your convenience. So all you have to do is spray and use it. Make sure you have your proper P PPE. 
the concentrates are the things that you must mix yourself with water. So there's lots of things like that that you can purchase as well. Then look for words like broad spectrum, which are things that kill a vast array of things. And so reading the label is really important in order to not kill things that you don't want to kill. And then things like active ingredient. And we find this on the front of the label on the active ingredients area where it tells you what the things are in this product and what it, the concentration of that product. And so what that will tell you then is if you're looking at herbicides, insecticides, or fungicides. So remember that there's some things that you can do in order to make things easier. And the first biggest thing that you must do is read that label. And there's a lot of fine print on this, but take the time to do that. You won't be sorry. I get a lot of calls from people that are worried because they applied a product, then read the label, then figured out they were in trouble. So be aware that reading that label is worth every bit of time you spend on it. Of course, the first thing you should do before you purchase anything is identify the problem, then read that label, follow those instructions. And a special thanks does go out to Ace Hardware in Fremont for letting us use their store for this feature. Wander those aisles. I do love hardware stores. <laughs> All right, Kyle, uh, this is a, a viewer who has a Myers Lemon inside all, all winter and then all of these little dudes have decided they want to live there. So what is this and what should they do about it? I think we have three pictures of this. Yeah, I think this is soft brown scale. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's probably going to be, it's going to be a challenge. Um, soft brown scale is, they have an enormous host range. Um, definitely like citrus. And they're, they're really challenging to control. So, you know, another issue here I think that complicates it is, is the fact that this is, you know, this was a plant that he brings in uh, mm -hmm. during the winter, goes outside. So what happens with these scales is then basically they're just reproducing year round and you're getting overlapping generations. So there's not a specific time you can really target to hit that crawler stage, mm -hmm. which is what we're always looking for with scale insects. So um, what, what I would suggest is it's probably going to take multiple treatments with um, insecticidal soap or horticultural oil, um, you're, you might have to really get after it and do those many times to, to have some efficacy. Um, and then, you know, pruning wherever, wherever possible. Um, other, uh, excuse me, mechanical removal. So if you can, you know, you can remove those, wipe them off. Uh, since they are soft scale, you can do that. Um, it might be a little bit labor intensive, but it sounds like these are maybe a little bit more valuable trees that you want to keep, so it might be worth, you know, worth putting in that effort mm -hmm. and, um, and just try to stay on top of it. You probably won't get rid of them, but, but at least if you can manage them, then mm -hmm. you can probably save those trees. And harvest those lemons. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kyle. All right. Uh, this is our first one of these this year, Amy. This is two pictures, uh, eight knockout roses. Uh, they've done very well, 12 to 15 years old. This year, two, sh two of them have abnormal thorn growth. The plant in the middle is stunted and the leaves are very red. What is this and what do we do? In my sick, demented way, this is one of my favorite rose diseases. It is <laughs> rose rosette. Um, very common, you get that excessive thorniness, we get the shortening of the plant um, and that bright red color. Mm -hmm. So management, you need to pull it out, you gotta get rid of it um, because it will move to the other roses in there. Make sure you clean your tools in between um, and then replace it. Mm -hmm. And you can replant in the same hole. You can, it, yeah. you're perfectly fine. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it's a very unique disease and mm -hmm. when you see it, you see it. Um, I know Rock has shown in the past, there's been some indication if you get a glyphosate application when the rose is in dormant seeds that sometimes will get the exact same symptomology. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't sprayed glyphosate around your roses, it is rose rosette. If it is glyphosate or if you have sprayed, you can wait and see if it's going to grow out of it. But most of the time, I'm still going to tell you to rip it out. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Amy. Okay, uh, Jeff, this is a uh, Woodland Hills area, Western Oto County. They had, of course, heavy rain, high wind, columnar evergreens, and these kind of look like Taylor junipers. They were pushed about 45 degrees from vertical, 
pull them back, stake them, tamp down the soil, anything else they should do, or will this work? Well, um, it, it may work. Um, so I've had some some success doing that sort of thing. So, and you know, I think this is probably uh, you know quickly a good learning thing for any folks that have a columnar tree, whether it's an evergreen or deciduous. You know, a couple things to think about is making sure that we're not planting too deep. There isn't a basket still in that tree. Um, anything like that that may be inhibiting root growth that allowed it that to happen. Um, right now, so as far as making sure that we have good soil around that, maintain moisture. Uh, don't over mulch it, so we don't want to keep the soil saturated in that site. Again, we want the roots to grow, and these can be um, sensitive to too wet a soil, so you're going to want to allow that soil to dry out. Mm -hmm. Keep it staked. It might take a couple years, but um, hopefully they'll come out of it. Hope we don't have yet another storm from right. the same direction. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. All right, your next one is just sort of fun, and I gave it to you because it could have gone to somebody else, but this but is a Valparaiso viewer. They've lived there 20 years and wow. they've never seen the dandelions do this before. They wonder what caused the weirdness. They don't use chemicals, but they are surrounded by uh, corn and soybeans. Well, this is a uh, fascinating fascination. <laughs> um, we need a t-shirt. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So it can be caused by any number of things. Herbicide, any kind of injury, could be a hormonal thing, insects. So you see it in a wide variety of things. We saw it in um, um, blue mist pyrrhea earlier this year. We've seen it in a lot of different things. So Sumac. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So you see it in a lot of different things. It is, it is very interesting. It's mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. Won't hurt anything. Right. And Don't eat it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sends a great picture to us. Yeah, That's yeah. always fun to talk yeah. about every year. All right. We have, uh, we have a couple of announcements of good things in the gardening world. The first one is the May Museum's 22nd Perennial Plant Sale, May 1st, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., and that is in Fremont, so you get back just in time to go to the spring game if you hurry, right? And our second one is us. We have started Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer again this year. You can watch us on Facebook Thursdays, 8 p.m. Central. And it starts very next week. And our first person uh, out of the gate is Rock. So, of course, he's always both interesting, challenging, and has good information. All right, we have just a little bit of time for a question. Um, Kyle, this is a, a Grand Island viewer who had spruce needle miners on seven-year-old trees and wants to know how, what to spray with and when. Oh, um, you can pass. I, yeah, I have to pass. That's one I'd have to look into. All right, good, we'll do that because if it's time, then we'll let them know. Yep. All right, uh, Amy, mm -hmm. so this is a viewer who uh, last year had disease in their potatoes and they're not saying whether it was the interior or the, the plant themselves. They're wondering, can they plant their potatoes in the same place? Um, I would avoid planting them in the same place. Most likely you're dealing with a scab if it's on the outside. Um, that fungus is in the soil, so I would definitely move my potatoes. And with any gardening, we always recommend rotation anyway because of disease and pressure mm -hmm. issues. Right. Okay, Jeff, this has actually come from two or three viewers with our, with our very interesting spring season. Mm -hmm. They still have some shrubs that they want to relocate but they've completely leafed out. Mm. What are we gonna suggest on that? You know, I would say with uh, the way the climate is right now, um, I, would, I would hold off. I think I'd wait till later in the year, maybe August, September to do that. Okay. But there, it's becoming warmer very quickly, and, and so I think survival would be a little tough right now to hand dig something. Well, especially if you're in the part of the state where it's not just warm, it's not wet. Right, right. So we've got all that wilting that is really occurring. Yeah, so, so I'd hold off till later in the year. Right, a little patience goes yeah. a very long ways in the gardening world.